Right, so this video is hopefully going to be quite short uh, and is going to cover entropy, uh, what it is quite briefly, and then sort of how that applies to the uh, the exam paper really and kind of how you can access the questions that can be asked on various aspects of entropy and the calculations involved as well. Um, so first off, entropy, what is entropy? Well, in, and I spoke to a lecturer once, I was in a, well, I was on a course with some lecturers once who made the point they didn't like this definition, but the thing is from an exam point of view, they are very keen on the definition of entropy basically being a measure of disorder. So entropy essentially measures how ordered or disordered a, a system, a substance actually is. A bit of a better way to kind of think about what entropy is, and it makes more sense as, as sort of a go on, and I talk about other, other parts of it and how it kind of actually links into various uh, chemicals and all the rest, is that entropy essentially is kind of governs the the number of arrangements of a group of particles is, is another way to think of it. Uh, it has the symbol S and the units of entropy are joules per Kelvin per mole. So that is essentially entropy is. It's a measure of disorder, it's given the symbol S. Uh, delta S would be a change of entropy, just as an uh, enthalpy change uh, would be have a uh, enthalpy change would have a delta H, entropy change has a delta S, don't confuse the two terms, and it's got these different units. Key one is it's joules, not kilojoules, uh, which we'll come on to uh, later on. So, uh, yeah, measure of disorder and all the rest. Um, the best way to kind of to look at that, actually, as I said at the very start, is to actually apply it to some various uh, situations. So if we look at water uh, and the three states of water, so we can have water, H2O, as a solid or ice. We can have H2O uh, as it, in its liquid form, as liquid water, and we can have H2O in its uh, gaseous form, so steam. And if we look at the actual entropy values for these three states, we get an idea of kind of how entropy is applied to this. So in the solid state, uh, water, the value is 48 joules per Kelvin per mole. Look in the liquid state, it has a value of 70 joules per Kelvin per mole. And in the gaseous state, it has a value of 189 joules per Kelvin per mole. As we move then from solid through to liquid through to gas, we can see that our entropy values are increasing, 48 to 70 to 189. The reason for this is that using this term disorder, as we move from a solid to a liquid, we are becoming more disordered. As we move from a liquid to a gas, we are becoming more disordered again. Um, the idea really is that in a solid, if you think about a solid, that sort of very kind of almost year seven, very early year sort of way of describing solids is those, that very regular arrangement of these particles that sort of sit on the spot and they vibrate and all the rest. And we move to a liquid and they're moving around each other. They they can fill their container and all the rest. You move to a gas uh, and they can completely fill their container, you know, into into all into all the sort of the crevices and the corners uh, and they can move all over the place. They're moving very quickly. So actually that idea of, of, of states does give us this this clear idea of how disorder is increasing. Um, as we increase the temperature of something, we increase its entropy. So in between here, we have a scale really of, of our solid, and this is probably these are probably uh, standard uh, entropy values that are probably measured at I don't know what 298 Kelvin or whatever. Um, we would find that actually increasing the temperature of a system or of a substance would increase its entropy value as well because the more energy we put into a system, uh, the more disorder there is or the more arrangements we can have of, of that various situation. Uh, there's loads of analogies that relate to entropy, things like uh, messy rooms and things. You know, a room is more likely to tend towards being disordered because there are loads of arrangements for a messy room. There are very few arrangements for a very nice, clean, tidy room. Um, a pile of bricks, if you've got a nice pile of bricks in front of you and you throw them 10 meters it's incredibly unlikely that they will land arranged as they initially were because there's very few arrangements that are nicely ordered bricks versus the random fall that they will move into uh, when you throw them because there actually there are many many more arrangements and this idea of things becoming more disordered kind of it ties into like our lives really headphones in your pocket same idea they become tangled uh, because there are loads of loads of different arrangements of our tangle they become more disordered so this is it tied to actual chemical system or a situation 
So what about reactions then? So when we look at reactions, generally speaking, we would look for entropy changes to be positive in a reaction for us to determine that, that reaction is likely to occur. Or the term they, that is quite good to use is that that reaction will be feasible. You can also use the term spontaneous. Um, my understanding is the term spontaneous and feasible are actually interchangeable. Neither dictate the speed of the reaction. They just say whether that reaction will occur or not without the idea of it being sort of helped along by us. It will just be able to occur on its own steam or it will not. Feasible means it will. Unfeasible or not feasible means that it will not. There may still be an activation energy barrier. That's the worth noting. Once that's overcome, it will... Uh, happen on its own accord if, if it's a feasible reaction if it's not going to then happen on its own accord without constant input from us we would say it's not feasible so actually looking at these and so we're looking for positive uh, entropy change really is what we're looking for and I've got a nice example here and that is the uh, formation of calcium oxide from calcium carbonate <laughs> So when we look this up and we work out the entropy change, entropy change is calculated looking at the entropy of the product. And really I should do this, oh, I forget which way around, which, is it that way around? Or is it that way around? I think it's that way around, isn't it? No, it's that way around. Anyway, the sum of the entropy of the products minus the sum of the entropy of the reactants taking into account any molar ratios. This one, they're one to one to one. So we don't need to worry about that. But these are molar entropy values. So if we had two moles of calcium oxide, we would have to double that value up. Now the values, and you'd be given this in an exam, the values are as follows. We have 39.7 for my calcium oxide, 213.6 for my carbon dioxide, and 92.9 here. And if we were to put our state symbols in, this matches with what we've already said about entropy. Solids here, much lower values, gases much, much higher as we would expect. And when we come to calculate this, we would simply put those numbers into here. Products would be 39.7 add 213.6 added together minus 92.9 and we should find that the overall entropy change for this reaction is 160.4 sorry, joules per Kelvin per mole. Therefore this reaction is feasible it's gonna happen that's all very fine all fine and dandy everything's happy there this is they like this in the exam this will be worth two or three marks this calculation on its own really easy to do though you've just got to remember this again not going to be given that you need to remember that the entropy change is equal to the sum of the entropy of the products minus the sum of the entropy of the reactants okay so let's look at another example here let's look at the reaction of ammonia with hydrogen chloride gas. Now, if we look at what we've talked about entropy already, and I'll add some other bits here, we've got loads of entropy in these two guys here because they're both gases. We've got not as much entropy here but in our in our solid. So this reaction, we would imagine here, and compared to this one up here, where we've got solid becoming a solid and a gas, more disordered in our products also, one mole or one molecule is becoming two. If one thing becomes two, we have more arrangements available, we have more disorder. Now this one, we have two gases or two molecules becoming one, and that's two gases uh, becoming a solid. So we would expect for this to have a negative entropy change. And if we stick our numbers in, uh, value for this is 192.3, value for this is 186. Point eight, and the value of this is 94.6. A lot of this information, actually, in the way I've structured this, the way that I've taught it this year in particular, um, is I, I used, uh, or I found a site called the Quantum Casino, made by the Royal Society of Chemistry, which is absolutely fantastic. It's really, really amazing. Some great, really good, easy to understand um, stuff on entropy. Take a little bit, bit beyond the uh, A-level curriculum as well, and I'll try and remember to put the link in the uh, description. But honestly, check it out. It's really, really, really good. Some nice little animations. You need, uh, I think, Java or whatever to be uh, on your browser, so you can't do it on Chrome. Um, but really, really, really good. Really great site. So some of this is, is very similar. But it, for me, it was just such a good help to actually to be able to teach because it just gave such such great sort of uh, pointers, which were actually really, really uh, easy to understand. 
uh, which is obviously the point when you're teaching, you're trying to trying to explain things. So these are our values, and when we calculate our entropy change, delta S, again, sum of the uh, entropy of the products uh, minus the reactants, we come out with a value of minus 284.5 joules per Kelvin per mole, as we would expect. But this is where it becomes tricky. This reaction is feasible. This reaction, you'll have perhaps seen, it's used to demonstrate diffusion. You have uh, ammonia at one end of a, of a sealed glass tube and you have hydrogen chloride, concentrated ammonia, concentrated hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid at one end and the vapour basically moves across the tube and what we end up with is somewhere in the middle we have this little, this little ring of ammonium chloride is formed. Here's our little that's terrible. CO2, it forms there. It's like, ooh, it looks pretty cool. It's quite cool. But it clearly happens, and we don't have to put any effort into it at all. And this is the issue, is that actually looking at this individual equation, we would say that this certainly is not going to be a feasible reaction. But, as I said, it definitely is. So why? Well, what we find out is actually, and I haven't got the actual value on me, um, but the enthalpy change for this is negative. It's something around minus 177, I think. Either way, it's a negative enthalpy change, so it's an exothermic reaction. And what we find is that actually, in this case here, when this reaction takes place, energy is released, uh, and whilst the entropy of this particular reaction, or this system, if you like, does not increase, the energy that's released heats up the environment, the surroundings, and what happens is because they gain energy, their entropy increases, and that is enough to outweigh this negative change here. So really, we can change. What I said before is that positive entropy changes give us feasible reactions. That's not a lie, but it needs to be a positive entropy change taking into account the entire universe. So if when a reaction takes place the universe's entropy increases then we would say that that is a feasible reaction um, which sounds just absurd and ridiculous but actually it's 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 real it's true it's it's a real thing uh, and rather than having to worry about all this stuff and you can derive this and if you have a look on that quantum casino website I mentioned then you'll see the derivation of this but taking into account this uh, the enthalpy change as well as entropy changes is another uh, an equation and this is an equation which is delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Now this is here. Delta G is what's called Gibbs free energy. And that has the units of kilojoules per mole. And this is Gibbs free energy. This is our old friend here. Lovely enthalpy change. Kilojoules per mole again. T is temperature in Kelvin. And delta S is our entropy change, again, in joules per Kelvin per mole. So if we're doing calculations here, and I'm going to go on to some exam questions shortly, if we're doing any calculations with regard to these, we need to convert this into kilojoules, which means we need to divide our entropy values by 1,000 to account for the fact that actually we're going from joules to kilojoules, so that actually our units stay as they should, and that's very important. Otherwise, things are going to get numbers are going to be um, a factor of a thousand out, which is which is obviously a very very bad thing. Now, this equation ties in, as I said, enthalpy change along with temperature, which is also very important, and entropy change. And if we find that we have a negative value, negative, that is going to tell us reaction is feasible. Still using the same word feasible, but now a delta G value that is negative when we put in our enthalpy change, our entropy change, and the temperature that this particular reaction is occurring at. If we find our value is negative, the reaction will happen. If we find our value is positive, the reaction will not happen. I.e. It will be feasible if it's negative. It will not be feasible if it is positive. And that's related to this value of delta G. Now, I'm not going. I'm, I'm going to go through some other points actually within an exam paper itself rather than uh, talking about it right here. So the, the other bits that link into the calculations of this I'm going to talk about in uh, an actual exam paper. All I want to actually mention now really is, is the idea of, oh I've reached the end of my page, it's how that delta G, uh, delta H and all the rest of it, how that ties into various situations. So uh, we can look at something like this. 
So I've got four different situations. I've got exotheric and endotheric reactions with various entropy changes linking into the idea of whether these reactions will be feasible or not. So this is the equation that we're using the whole time. So will these reactions occur or will they not? Will they be feasible or not? So if we have an exothermic reaction, and I'm using very general terms here with a positive entropy change, will that reaction be feasible? So an exothermic reaction means that this value here is going to be negative, and this value here is going to be positive. Now we're looking for a negative value for this to be feasible. Now if this value is negative and we take away a positive value, well, no matter what happens, no matter how big our values are, provided this is negative and this is positive, uh, because temperature can only ever reach zero as its minimum, because it's measured in Kelvin, there is no negative temperature. So actually, in this case, we will always have feasibility. The reaction will always be feasible if we have an exothermic reaction which has a positive entropy change. Brilliant. What about an exothermic reaction with a negative entropy change? So again, negative here but this value is now negative also. So I've got a negative value taking away a negative. That means that I've essentially got a negative adding stuff onto it. Now, this is a little bit more of a dodgy one because if, for example, the temperature is very high, so we have 10,000 degrees Kelvin, that's going to mean this value, this new point, this new part here is going to be quite large. So if we have a negative value added a very large value, we're going to find it has a positive Gibbs or delta G, that's bad. So this reaction will only occur, and this is all very sort of qualitative, there's no values associated, but this will only occur, it's only be feasible at lower temperatures. At high temperatures, this reaction, if it is an exothermic reaction with a negative entropy change, at high temperatures, and there will obviously be a cutoff, but generally speaking, at high temperatures, this will not occur, this will not be feasible. Flipping it around, we've got a positive change here, and we've got a positive change here this is the complete opposite if this is positive and we're taking away in this case uh, a, a number there this will only be feasible at high temperatures so that we need to make this bit very very large so that when we have this positive chunk here we take away a big number and suddenly it ends up being negative great obviously this takes it doesn't take into account exact values and again as I said temperatures will change for these two here the temperature is very very important and there will be a cutoff temperature this one temperature does not matter finally if I have a positive change here uh, and I end up with a, a negative entropy change because I've got positive minus a minus I'm always going to find this reaction is going to be unfeasible. It's never going to happen because no matter what temperature we're at, we're always going to find that we've got a positive and minus and minus. We're always going to be adding essentially two positive numbers together. Gibbs is just never, the delta G Gibbs value is never going to get anything besides positive. This is some ger generic stuff which I think helps sort of break down the understanding of this. Um, I'm now going to look at some exam questions and particularly look at the calculations involved in the uh, Gibbs stuff, particularly looking at temperatures. Not going to do a lot of them, just uh, just a couple of questions. Um, uh, and yeah, so let's have a look at examples. First one's going to be a question, and uh, we'll start question 5e from uh, January 2010. Okay, so the first question then. So as I said, we're on January uh, 2010, question 5. I've ignored the other bits before this. They are entropy related, but I really want to do some calculations. The other stuff you can kind of answer with some of the theory that I've talked about. Uh, just take a little bit of thought on some of it. Um, but I wanted to go really into sort of this question here on 5e uh, and look at a bit of the calculations in a bit more detail. So the first one is a standard, nice, simple one. It's quite nice because I get to use the moles as well. Calculate the value of the entropy change, delta S. Uh, so standard ent entropy change, the formation of one mole of ammonia. Uh, so here's the equation. We've got we've given some numbers here, which is great. Remember, these are molar values, so we have to incorporate the half here and the, th uh, the three tooths there, and we are given an entropy change, but we don't need that right now. So calculate a value. So our delta S, remember, is our sum of the products minus, so I need to really get better at that, uh, sum of the reactants, uh, and all we do is put these numbers in. So products, ammonia on its own, so 193, easy. Got two numbers here, so we'll start with nitrogen, so it's going to be 192 times a half, added to uh, 131 times three tooths, three halves might be a better way to say that, anyway, it doesn't matter. 
uh, and that comes out with a value of minus 99.5 joules per Kelvin per mole. Don't forget the lovely units. Two marks, though. That's really easy. That's honestly, that's. I mean, they're giving away. This is just ridiculous. They're giving away the marks. Um, okay. Here. What we're doing is look at this question here. Now, I actually thought it was, it was worded slightly differently, but there we go. I can get over that. The point at which a reaction becomes feasible, uh, at that point, we would say that delta G is equal to zero. So this is the point where it becomes feasible. That is crucial. And hopefully you've done that in lessons or all the rest. But if not, and I haven't explained that in this video at this point, but I want to do it within the calculations and it's not quite exactly as I wanted. But anyway, um, we are essentially, trying to work, yeah. So this question is saying, use this equation to calculate the temperature at which the value of G is. Below. It's actually saying, use this equation to calculate the temperature at which this reaction is feasible. It's exactly the same thing. So if you see that becomes feasible, you have to assume that delta G is zero for that to work. Otherwise, there's too many unknowns. So calculate the temperature at which this value becomes. Below. So the equation that we're going to use, of course, delta G is delta H minus T delta S. You're getting a mark. Just for spitting that equation out, it's ridiculous. Just giving it away. So, rearranging this, we find that T ends up being equal to delta H over delta S. Now, the delta H value is whoop, up here, minus 46.2. And our entropy value was minus 99.5. Minus 99.5. Remember, entropy is measured in joules per Kelvin per mole, whereas our entropy is measured in kilojoules. Uh, it doesn't really matter on this one where you put the conversions in, whether you go, you convert this to joules or this to kilojoules. I'll just do it, that one into kilojoules, divide by a thousand. And you should find that when you stick that through and you get your numbers in, you come out with a nice little value of 464 Kelvin. Easy. That's worth four marks. That is absolutely ridiculous. Like, there is just, uh, what is going on, basically, on this question to, to allow you to have four marks on that one. Absolutely absurd. Uh, we'll go this one as well. What can you deduce about the formation of ammonia if the reaction mixture is hit to a temperature above the value that we've calculated in part E part 2? Right, so what can you deduce about the formation of ammonia if the reaction mixture is hit to a temperature above the value that you've calculated in E part 2? Two. Right, well, if we think about this, our entropy value would remain constant. Our enthalpy value would be, uh, obviously, again, constant. And at this temperature, delta G would be zero. If we increase this temperature above, we would find that this portion here becomes more negative. But when we have a negative number minus a negative, um, we would find, therefore, that increasing the temperature would ultimately give us a positive value of delta G, therefore, no longer feasible or spontaneous, if you want. But uh, either one is fine, no, uh, no longer feasible. It's absolutely legit. Uh, that's the Jan 10 paper. Uh, I'm going to have a little look now at the June 13, because it's quite an interesting question there. Right, so... I've chosen this question because it's a little bit different. It's a little bit sort of out there. There are some other bits here in a three part A. Uh, but I wanted to go this one because I think it's a little bit one that can take you by surprise if you've never sort of looked at it and never really uh, concentrated and, and worked at what's going on. So it's this question here where they've got a graph and it is relating to entropy and Gibbs and all the rest of it. And it says, figure two shows how the free energy change for a particular gas phase reaction varies with temperature. So we can see that as temperature increases, our delta G value decreases. And then we've got this point here marked at 500. And the graph starts at 300 here. doesn't really matter. But this point here, 500, is potentially quite a key one. And it says, explain with the aid of thermodynamic equation why this line obeys a mathematical equation for a straight line, y equals mx plus c. Now, I am told reliably uh, by my students that this is at GCSE maths. So in theory, most people should have this understanding. Probably not something you come across, though, at A level much at all. And even if you are... If you're someone who doesn't do maths, it's potentially two years since you've come across this. But actually, it's not too bad because it says explain with the aid of a thermodynamic equation. Well, first of all, if I say, well, thermodynamic equation is delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. 
that gets me a mark. I get earn a mark just for saying that thermodynamic equation. That's really the only one that you know. So get it down. So now, now we have to look at this. We have to say, right, how does this work? How does this fit in relation to y equals mx plus c? And actually, this bit isn't as bad as you'd think. So if you say, right, y equals mx plus c. Well, let's say y on its own, right, that equates to delta g. <laughs> what thing is on its own? Right, this could be delta h. And then, therefore, we've got this one here. Now, x, y, actually, because it's the axis here, y must be delta g and x must be t. So I know that's going to be t there. And this is going to be my delta s value there. And I've got to obviously include my, my minus there somewhere. We could do minus t or whatever, but it works there. And actually what we get is when we look at this, uh, why does this line obey the mathematical equation and all the rest? Well, if you actually wrote this like this, you would actually earn the other marks because the other mark is really just for saying that enthalpy change is C uh, and delta S is m. The other way you can say is that delta h and delta s are constants. Uh, and the reason is that delta h actually, this is our c here, which is our delta h, and that's our y-intercept. And actually that number remains constant at this particular system. Our gradient here is minus delta s. And that is also, and that's m, that is also constant here because that is not changing now. It's a straight line, therefore gradient is constant. And of course, C there is also a constant. So there's a few things you could say, but just writing this out in that format actually gets you the second mark. And there's only two marks uh, for this. Now, what other questions say? Explain why the magnitude of delta G decreases as T increases in this reaction. So explain why the magnitude of delta G increases as T increases in this reaction reaction right so why does delta G decrease as T increases the reason for this is that if we look at the line here we know we've got a negative uh, gradient for the line therefore negative gradient bear in mind this is negative delta S means that our ent entropy change must actually be positive for this reaction so our entropy change is positive and that is actually all you need to say in this question if you said the entropy change is positive that is it because as t increases um, we can see that that therefore means that this portion here becomes uh, more negative therefore giving us a more negative value of delta g until we reach this point here and this is an important value and I've circled this actually earlier on because this is the point at which delta g is zero and this is the point where the reaction becomes feasible at temperatures above 500 kelvin down here we are going to find feasibility below 500 nada important uh, Oh, there you go. Stay where you can produce about the feasibility of this reaction. Temperatures lower than 500 Kelvin, not feasible. Easy. Uh, let's have a look at this last little bit there. Um, we're going to do that one. Yeah, why not? So another one here. Delta S, same thing as before. Products minus reactants. Stick it all in. You end up with a value quite easily of 44.5. You can see this one's actually only worth one mark this time. Because uh, there really isn't a lot of work. How that other one was worth, I think it was two marks or three marks, it's just beyond me. Uh, but if it's, if you get that, brilliant. So calculate value this time with units for the entropy change of this reaction at 5440 Kelvin. So we've got our usual delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. But if we go back up to the question here, it says the reaction becomes feasible at 5440, pretty much. So that means we can say that actually zero here, we can assume this is at zero, so we can cancel it out. Delta H, therefore, is equal to T delta S. We're trying to find delta H, so we stick our values in. We do 5440 multiplied by our value of the entropy, which is 44.5, and that gives us a value of 2420AT. Do bear in mind at this point that obviously this is joules per mole and it is asking well the entropy change must be given in kilojoules per mole therefore you must actually 
make that conversion so it's 242 kilojoules per mole to convert this it down that is a key step um, and actually I'm going to leave that there hopefully that's enough in terms of practice as well uh, really the the equations and the calculations are all very very similar uh, give them a go do some practice on those uh, and I hope as always that has helped